Well, what did he write? This book. It's a beautiful book. Uh, Daniel and his personal friends, and that's chapters one through six. Uh, chapter one, they wouldn't eat the meat. Chapter two, this dream deal. Chapter three, they wouldn't bow down to the image. Uh, chapter four, another dream. Chapter five, the right handwriting on the wall. You can always remember that because hand has five fingers and he writes on the wall. Chapter six, the king's decree and the lion's den. And then all the rest, uh, Daniel talks about the future of Israel in chapter 7 through 12. Uh, Daniel is one of the more contested books in the Bible. Gen uh, Genesis is contested, Daniel's contested, Revelation's contested. The reason Genesis is contested by liberals is they don't want to have a divine origin, they don't want to have marriage and, and morality be written down by God. The reason Daniel is so contested by the liberals is because Daniel writes with such clarity and detail about the future that no liberal can believe God could possibly do that. They don't even really believe in God as we know him from the scriptures. So many people have assaulted this book. And what they basically, if, if you read what the mainline you know, denominational churches say about Daniel, they say it was written in the intertestamental period as a book of history, not a book of prophecy. And it is a book of prophecy because we know who wrote it. We know when he lived. We know when he was carried away. And we know that all the events Daniel spoke about were in the future. And it's marvelous when you see God's hand in prophecy. What was Daniel? And this is where we're going to have a good time. And there's a lot of material here in this book. And I hope I uh, don't discourage you by talking fast. I hope I stimulate you to want to really get to know this book. And, and I was speaking with someone today, and they said, you know, I, I listen to my Bible tapes, so I'm always learning from the book that, that you're hitting and, and trying to learn from it. And I said, isn't that a blessing? And I hope that that's part of what the Wednesday nights do is stimulate you to study. He was a man of godliness, and we can look at the elements of his life. Uh, we already saw the first one. The first element was self-denial. He learned how to say no to his flesh. And if you can never learn how to say no to your flesh, you will never grow in godliness. The first thing that grace teaches us is to deny ourself, our ungodliness, our flesh. And, and if you meet someone that can't ever say no to themselves, I have a good friend, and he calls it mind over mattress. That's a good place to start. If you never have gotten mind over mattress, you probably don't start your day right. And what happens is you stay in a little bit too long, and then you're flustered and running in every direction, and, and you don't have time to quietly meet with the Lord. Now, it doesn't mean, the Bible doesn't say a godly Christian always starts their day with a massive Bible study. But every one of us, have to reorient ourselves for the day. And reorienting ourselves is looking at a fixed point and, and getting our bearings. And that fixed point, everything else is moving around in our world, is the Word of God and the author of this book. And, and Daniel had mind over mattress, and he denied himself. He had biblical discipline. It says in Titus 2.11 that we need to learn to deny ungodliness and let grace teach us that. Secondly, the second... Uh, character quality or element of his life is that he had a quiet trust in the Lord. Uh, remember a couple weeks ago when we were going through Isaiah 30 where it says, in quietness and confidence shall be your strength. That's what he had. Listen to 2.18. Uh, he, he learned in this verse that the only way to survive spiritually was to cling to the Lord. We either will cling to the Lord or to our own selfishness. And, and this, this element is dependence. It's a quiet trust. And you remember when we read that, that, that he immediately, as soon as the edict from the king came, they besought the God of heaven. And that was the quiet trust, the quiet confidence, the dependence. That every matter that came in life, no matter how big or how little, if it's just a little deal or if it was a life-changing deal, take it to the Lord in prayer. That's why the songwriter says, have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. What? Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll tend and keep thee. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And, and we just need to let go of things and, and not carry them around. It's like the fellow that was carrying an you know, 80-pound bag of grain down the road, and someone came along with a cart, and he says, oh, thanks for the ride. And he just kind of pushed up and sat on the back of the thing and kept carrying the grain bag. Did you know that's how we live the Christian life? The Lord says, roll your burdens onto me. And it's like, offload them. And we, we say, thanks, Lord. We sit there and keep the burden on us. And he says, no, no, a quiet dependence. Thirdly, chapter 2, verse 28 tells us the third character quality that he had was he was humble. He had humility. Chapter 2, verse 28, 
There is a God in heaven. Now, I'm going to repeat this again tonight, a little later in a different way, but, but I like it. It's like, it'd be like if all of a sudden all the lights went off here and a spotlight came and, and all you could see was me standing here with a spotlight. That's what happens in Daniel's life. And everybody's looking at him at that moment because, because the king was scared and he didn't know what to do. And Daniel reveals the, the dream and he is the center of focus in all of the empire that's ruling the world at the time. And as soon as the spotlight gets on him, he goes like this. It says... It's God. That's not very common nowadays. A lot of times when the spotlight gets on, people say, yes, I'll sign that autograph. Oh, uh, it's a great book I wrote. Oh, boy, isn't it? I'm a great singer. and Oh, yeah, the fastest growing church in the world. You know, and it's just, uh, I read a book about the ten greatest Christians and how I discipled the other nine. You know, I mean, that's just the philosophy that, that you see nowadays. It's just that totally lacking in humility. There is, verse 28, a God in heaven. And he points to God. I like that. Fourthly, he has a transparent life. Chapter 5, verse 11, um, which is, is one of many times. This is what other people say about him. And if you, if you and I have a transparent life, you know, we don't have to wear the sandwich board saying, I'm a Christian, you know. Uh, you know and, and when you're walking, there's a message. You ever, when I lived in L.A. with Bonnie... And we used to minister out there. There was one place where you'd always see this guy wearing a sandwich board. And, you know, maybe that was his calling. But I wonder how much more effective it would have been if people would have known his message without him wearing the sandwich board with the big sign on it. And look what happened with Daniel. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is a spirit of the holy gods. Now, how did people know that? Not just of the gods. They knew there was a difference. They knew there were a lot of kinds of gods. This was not the, the wine-drinking, carousing gods. This was the holy gods. This guy, I mean, he's different. He's not like us. And in the days of your father, illumination, insight, wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. James 3:17. The wisdom that is from above. Did you know that's what we're all recipients of? If if we are willing and if we are receptive, we can have God's wisdom from above. Daniel certainly had it, and that wisdom was found in him. He had a transparent life. People would just see the Lord in him. They could. It's really exciting. I remember going to a Christian school. I remember that I lived in a dorm room, dorm, tiny dorm room. When I think about how small that was, I'm sure I was abused by not having enough space. But I remember, I mean, we were given a little closet space this big and one long drawer and another drawer and, you know, a couple of bins. And that's all. I mean, that's all the room you had. You had to condense down to that. Five guys in this little room. Whew, smell of tennis shoes enough to just bring back terrible memories, you know. It was really something. But I remember that in that room, it was one room. If you turned on the light, everybody woke up. So if you wanted to have time with the Lord, you couldn't turn the light on in the room. So I remember that, that I had an early job, and if I wanted to read the Bible, I had to get out and sit in the hallway. I remember every morning I'd get out of bed and try not wake him up, and I'd go out and sit in the hallway, and I'd half asleep, and I'd try and read my Bible and, you know, start the day with the Lord. And, you know, after a couple of weeks, I remember sitting out there, and I was reading my Bible, and I heard kind of a sound, but, you know, you hear lots of sounds, and I heard, <laughs> I looked, there's this guy sitting next to me. What's wrong? He says, he said, I'm really having a struggle with my wife. And he says, when I go to the bathroom, I see you out here, and I figured if you're out here reading the Bible, you must be able to help me. So, and I thought, you know what? People are watching. I mean, I never noticed this guy going to the bathroom. Uh, I mean, that wasn't what I was doing. I was looking in the Bible. But people will watch you, and they'll see where you turn when, when your world is falling apart. We should have a transparency in our lives, transparent lives. He was unselfish in chapter 5. Uh, keep your stuff, he says, when they put the gold chain around him. He was exemplary. They examined him. They, they put Klinger, the government oversight office on him. Couldn't find, I mean, he was squeaky clean. They couldn't have any hearings because there was nothing wrong with Daniel except in his worship of God. Oh, boy, wouldn't that be neat if we got, if we got a complete FBI background check and they say the only thing we can find is they're very religious. You know, no, They've always paid their taxes. They've never cheated. They've never uh, 
been taken advantage of people. They've never been known to, they just, they're, too, they're very, very religious. What a blessing if they see that. He was consistent. But he had biblical praying in his life. Number one, biblical prayer is, um, is tied to the scriptures. Uh, you, you can't, God, God likes us to pray back to him his word. You know, God really is kind of partial to his word. It is. You know, he wrote it. It's perfect. He said it's sufficient and it's everything. And, you know, he likes our stuff, but he really likes us to, to kind of reflect our prayers through his word and come to him through his word. And Daniel's a model of that. In fact, Daniel's one that, that invented the ACT model, ACTS, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. He invented it. And you've probably heard that over the years. You always wondered, well, that's really clever. Daniel thought of it. And it's right there in chapter 9. And you can look at that. His prayers uh, are tied to the scriptures. Secondly, biblical prayer leads to a reverent attitude. I mean, if you are praying from the scriptures to an awesome holy God, you will have and I will have an aura of reverence. Now, someone asked me recently, they said, Pastor, I'm trying to explain to someone why they shouldn't wear their baseball cap to church. Where should I start? And I said, well, I said, you know, you can start anywhere in the Bible you want. Because our God is an awesome, holy God. And he is so holy that when we come before him, we are undone. And we are overwhelmed at his majesty. That's why we should dress when we come to church. I mean, if, if you have uh, several types of clothes, if you have normal clothes and if you have your immodest clothes, and if you have your modest clothes, which ones do you think you should wear to church? The most modest clothes that you have. Why? It's because this place is really legalistic? No, it's because we have such a high regard for the infinite, holy, awesome, reverential majesty of the Most High God. Did you know that when priests in the Old Testament came to the altar, men, they had to wear pantaloons down to their knees, underneath their robe. I mean, men and women all wore the same thing. That really ruins people to say that women can't wear pants because everybody in the Old Testament world wore a robe. You remember, you know, the cloaks and robes and all that stuff? But the men that served at the altar, it says in Exodus, God says, don't come unless you have your linen breeches on down to your knees. Now you say, what does that have to do with anything? What that has to do with is that God said, I am I am of pure eyes and to behold evil. He says, I don't want to see your flesh displayed before me. Clothing was given because of sin, not for, for Madison, or not Madison Avenue. Who decides clothes? Paris. It wasn't given for the Paris fashion shows. It was God gave clothing to cover our bodies because we're sinful. You say, what does that have to do with baseball caps? Well, one of the signs of respect that you have is, I mean, have you ever been in an old-fashioned baseball game when they play the national anthem? What does everybody do? They all take their hat off and put it over their heart. And you know what? Where's the American flag? I mean, that American flag is very valuable. A lot of people died for it. It's nothing compared to God. And if a bunch of pagans will take their hat off for a flag, anyone that wouldn't take their hat off for God doesn't have a problem with hats. They have a problem with reverence. And God, if we are in his word and if we are in before him in prayer, reverence will characterize our lives. That's why the, the writer of Proverbs said that, that when you have godly wisdom, you will rise up before a gray head. Now, oh, another rule. No, it's just a reverent attitude. I mean, when the little old lady gets on the bus, she'll get up. Why? Because your mom told you to? No, because you're so reverent. And you're, so, you're so honoring their age. And you're so honoring the fact that, that God honors the weak. And there's something about that, that that Daniel mirrors in his life. I mean, he was a man of power, but yeah, he had a very reverent, submissive spirit to God. Thirdly, biblical prayer sees God at work in life. And in chapter 9, verse 15, he says, uh, You brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made a name for yourself, as it is this day we've sinned. He, he could see God's hand in life. He saw God's deliverance. And that's why whenever there's a testimony time, uh, you and I should be always in the back of our mind kind of having, uh, you know, you can program your computer that when, when you look at the file menu, it'll show you the last eight files or however many you want that you've opened. And even though you've shut them, it will remind you of what you've been in lately. 
Well, you know what? We should have kind of a little file manager that we keep a record of what God's been doing lately in our life. And if someone comes to you and says, what's the Lord doing in your life? You ought to have a few files back there saying, oh, I've seen him at work. I've seen him, like I heard on Saturday, someone says, I like the men's study because I never underlined anything in my Bible before. You know, that's a miracle. Changing our lives to seek after God and his word. That's the hand of God in our life. You should be, just like that, be able to say, this is what the Lord's doing in my life. He saw God at work in his life. Number four, biblical prayers seek the honor of God. It's not a performance. It's not me showing off. It's honoring God. And you know what's really neat is when you pray and, and when everyone isn't even thinking about what you're praying, they're just, I mean, they're just in awe of the Lord. And you're just kind of like reflecting the glory back to him. Kind of exciting. Biblical prayers are consistent. 616, he prayed all the time. He didn't pray just, you know, when he had a laundry list of needs. Biblical prayers open God's heart. You know what it says in verse 11? Then he said to me, chapter 10, verse 11, O Daniel, man of high esteem, or dearly beloved. Did you know God doesn't say that about very many people? He said Daniel was dearly beloved. Beloved of God. Why? Because... God's heart was open to him because he so sought the Lord. 